It was an off-season that we will all remember. And in the final season of the Pac-12 as we know it, comes season three of the It Factory. It will be full of players that are on preseason watch lists, will be on future NFL draft lists. As always, we will take the helmet off of the top players on the West Coast and tap into who they are and why they stand out. I'm Yogi Roth, and welcome back to the It Factory. Welcome back or welcome to the It Factory. I'm your host, Yogi Roth, and I'm really proud of this episode that we put together for you on a bunch of levels. The story in and of itself is powerful, but the details, I think, are what will grab you. Our guest is Tez Johnson, wide receiver for the Oregon Ducks. Tez Johnson transferred in this past offseason, and as you probably know by now, because here we are in the middle of the college football season, he's also the adopted brother of quarterback Bo Nix. Did a feature on Bo Nix and his story of coming to Oregon and coming back for this final season, and also how his family has grown since he's been in Oregon. And part of that story was talking to Tez Johnson. When I sat down with him, I said, wow, TJ Brassel, our producer, we've got to make this a full episode and tell this story. So you hear from Tez, of course, you'll hear from Bo as well. And you'll even hear from the Knicks family about the impact that Tez Johnson has had on them and this Oregon program and the community in Eugene. Enjoy. All right, so I wanna start with where you started when you walked in, you said, this was my dream school. Yeah. What about Oregon made it your dream school when you were, how old? I was like, I wanna say I was like five. Honestly, I wanna say like I'm five and my stepdad put on an Oregon like, game or something. And I just remember LaMichael James. And ever since then, I've been an Oregon fan ever since. And he used to show me jerseys every other day. I just knew like they came out with jerseys. Like, it was crazy, different colors. I used to love them because of just the colors. But more and more I got older, but Michael James, I started knowing the players like Farrell Brown. I used to go outside and mimic Farrell Brown, like the plays he used to make or something. And he used to be in the road playing two-hand touch football. And I used to just say, hey, I'm Farrell Brown, touchdown. And I mean, I just been an Oregon fan my whole life. Wow. All right, so when you're in high school, you're starting to gain a little of attention Mm -hmm. Were you calling Oregon saying, hey guys, take a look at me? <laughs> uh, no, not actually. I wasn't. I always had hopes like, okay, maybe I can get off from Oregon. But it just never came around. Um, everybody in high school knew I was an Oregon fan. Everybody around me was an Alabama fan, an Auburn fan, Georgia fan. I was the only, I was the only Oregon fan. It was just, it was crazy. I mean, it was just crazy. Wow. So now that you're here. Yeah. I'm curious what it was like the first time you walked into this beautiful facility. Okay, when Bo actually first came out here, he was he he t brought me on a visit. I wanted to come like as soon as he wanted to come out here, but like he had to fill it out first and stuff like that. And then I want to say like a few months later, I got on the flight and I came. And coming off the exit, this Eugene exit, I just saw the O and I was like, Nah, this is so real. Like, I can, I'm excited, I can't, like, I can't keep my emotions together. I'm, I just wanted to touch everything, see everything, touch everything, and I saw the equipment and I just fell in love. Later, like a year later, who knew I'm here at Oregon. And it's, I never, since I've been here, I never had a dull moment. Every moment that's happened here at Oregon has been elite, is gonna be cherished in my heart for the rest of my life. All right, so let's rewind a little bit. Um, how would you describe yourself? I'm, I'm fun, I'm funny, I'm energetic. Every day you see me, I got some type of energy. Um, my mom says my, my smile attracts people and my coaches say the same thing. Like in interviews I read, like papers and stuff, they say I always have a smile on my face. So I think like the smile on my face and the energy I have daily, just being consistent and being a light in the room never like, being so down, I think that's really how I explain myself. Like, how. when was the first time you met Bo Nix? Um, I met him. I think it was my freshman year or my sophomore year. But he transferred over from Scottsboro. But he was at baseball at first. He was he was doing baseball at Pinson, and I I can remember like every day, like he'd come out and throw. And some days he wouldn't because he had practice, so we had to wait. But I was so anxious to meet him. 
So he came out one day and he threw with me and a couple other guys. And I just wanted to impress him. Like, I was this small bobblehead kid, probably no telling what my weight was at the time. I, was, I had a big head, small body, but fast and good hands. So every route he threw to me, I caught every pass. I was just out there with the footballs, you know, ready to go on the field. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how this is going to go. Um, and the first person that comes running out on the field is this little bitty, like scrawny kid, one of the skinniest kids I've ever seen in my entire life with the biggest head. He's just running out there, just like bouncing. He's like one of the most explosive guys I've been around. So his run and jog is just so graceful and just bounceful. And he gets out there and I'm like, you know, this dude's pretty good. Like he's the tiniest dude I've ever seen, but he has great ball skills. He runs great routes. And I asked him and this dude played quarterback the year before. Like he was on JV, ninth grade quarterback. Like he didn't even play receiver. But I met him and he was, he was just so, to me at a young age, he was so intense. Like, you didn't want to like disappoint him. Like he was a, you almost treat him as your coach. So I was, when I met him, I was just wanting to do everything perfect just for him. Like if he like it this way, do it for him. Like just do it. But I remember that first day I was there, he, he was one of the best guys out there. And, and I remember specifically telling my dad that, I don't know if this dude can play, but he's got the best hands, ball skills I've ever seen. So how did your relationship grow from freshman year on in high school? Um, it grew tremendous, tremendously, actually. It was, um, we, we started getting together, like, closer and closer as I, as I started to learn plays from him and actually working with him and just knowing, like, what he liked on the football field. Um, just like today, he's still a, in the film room guy. He's a, he's a film head. He was just like that in high school. And, I was not a film head. I can sit here and tell you I was not a film head. I was one of those guys that loves to just play football. Just go out there, play football, throw the ball to me, I'm going to make a play for you. But him him just being who he is is I mean, it's great. He's a he's just a good guy all around. Yeah. Could you tell that you were getting closer and closer to him and and then eventually meeting his parents? Uh Yes. Well, I met actually I didn't meet Mama Krista until I actually got adopted. I didn't I didn't meet her until I actually got adopted. I always saw our little brother Caleb. I always saw him cuz he'll come up after school like from the middle school and come up to high school and he I see him walk in and I What's up Caleb? What's up Tess? And we started getting closer and closer because I was just just a simple hey it was, I don't know, our bond just started to become closer and closer. When, when I got Bo to smile, actually, when I actually got him to smile, I did something, I, I can't remember what I did. I got him to smile and I was like, okay, I think I'm on his good side now, like, I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> so explain to me, you know, your parents, mm -hmm. your household, mm -hmm. and then eventually you get adopted into Bo's okay. household. Okay, when I was, I was a young, like, I was just little, I was always in trouble as a kid. I just never went home. I was one of those kids that's, I'm not going home, I'll just be at school the next day. I just knew football was my way out of doing something. So just my home environment, my brothers and sisters, we we're close, my mom, my biological mom, we we're close, we we're talk to them every day. Um, it's actually, we got really close. Like we got tighter and tighter as I got and became like a college student. Um, but the household was, it was it was a struggle just coming up, like we never had like anything really to like we didn't have beds at one point, didn't know where the next meal was coming from. Um, it was pretty tough. Just growing up in a crazy environment, you just see violence every day. Actually, one day our our house and our well, our apartment got shot into. Like we was coming home just late night. People thought we was um, some other people, and our house got shut up, so everybody had to just get on the floor. Um, and I knew that moment, like, I was, we, my family and I was this close to um, death, and I just knew, like, I can't, we, we can't do this anymore. Somebody had to make a change. 
Um, How old were you? I was like seven, eight. Seven, eight years old. Who's in yes. that house? It's your mom? It's me, my mom, my little brother, and my oldest brother. My little sister wasn't born yet. My biological dad is deceased. It was suicide. I was like a, a handheld baby. I couldn't remember. I can't tell you a story about it. But um, I always have a pic. I have a picture of him that I keep with me on my phone, just so I can just know his face. I look just like him. It's crazy. He's smiling on his face. I think that's why I get it from him, actually. But it's just walking around in in the neighborhood I was in. You see bullet shells, and you just walk around stepping on them, it was just so, it was almost depressing as a little kid, just seeing it. And you just knew right then and there you didn't want to be a part of it. And you knew it was only two ways you can go, being dead or in jail. And I didn't want neither, neither one of those. So I knew school and football can uh, give me a better shot. That's something I want in the future. When I actually got adopted, it was it was actually I want it was the it was the best thing ever um, happened to me. Um, it was one day um, I got in trouble, but like I said, I can go back to school, play football, and everything be okay. It was like my way out. It was like my my like comfort zone. Football. We had a parent meeting, and things were not going good at home. I got in trouble. It was. Um, it was just me and my mom, we was just into it, just not, just getting along. But my coach, which is my dad now, Patrick Nix. I just asked, look, can he just, why don't he just come stay with me for, for the night, for a couple of days, let's let things, you know, Duffy's. settle down and then, and then we'll go from there. And so they were like, okay, you know, he can go stay with you. So we didn't have practice that afternoon at the end of school. He got my car and I said, okay, we're gonna go to your house. We'll get what you need. Um, and, and literally we go to his house and, and <laughs> poor Tez, he, he grabbed just a couple of t-shirts and shorts and you know, doesn't grab his toothbrush. I said, one, yeah, one specific yeah, item. Oh um, yeah, he grabs a, well, he was wearing his Oregon sweatshirt to school mm -hmm. that day because um, he loved Oregon. And I remember the drive home in the car with dad, he said, do you like mac and cheese? <laughs> and I was like, yes. He, he was telling Mama Crystal on the phone, make some mac and cheese, like just make mac and cheese. And this is my, like this is my, like they had, we had cube steak, mac and cheese, asparagus, and mashed potatoes. It was a, it was a really good meal, honestly. He came over that night and, um, you know, he, my mom made um, hamburger steak. He calls it cube steak to this day. Don't, I don't even know why we remember that, but he just, he loved it, thought it was great. He was quiet at the time, like very like skittish. And you know, from our point of view, like we don't know Tez a whole lot. At the same time, he's like, I don't know these people. I don't know what's about to happen. I know mom, she saw the, the, the fear in my eyes and the, the nervousness as I walked in. We walk in and they were sitting at the dinner table and I knew right then and there I did not want to leave. We never sat at a Never really sat at a, a dinner table as a family, um, biologically. It was it was really hard. Um, but when I saw them eating at the dinner table, I was like, nah, I'm never gonna leave. Cutest little smile kid comes in with the Oregon Duck on him. And I said, are you for real an Oregon fan? Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, scared to death. Brought in a little cinch sack of stuff. And I told him I had three rules. I said, you say goodnight. We always tell each other goodbye when you walk out the door. And you are always welcome in my pantry. You never have to ask me for food. We ate cube steak. And I never, never ate a steak until that day. And I was trying to cut it and a piece of it fell on the floor. <laughs> and a piece of it fell on the floor. And I went down to pick it up and I came back up and everybody was staring at me. I was, I was just like, my bad, I'm sorry. And I was like, no, it's okay. And it was just the best moment of my life. And Mama Krista came to me and said, before you go to sleep, <laughs> she said, before you go to sleep, tell me you love me and give me a hug tonight. And I said, yes, ma'am. He sleeps fully clothed, 
like ready to escape at any time because at the time you know you got to understand Tez's point of view he was just doing whatever he had to do for himself you know take care of yourself I don't know if he got a wink of sleep that night don't know if he slept at all probably scared to death of the situation um, but then as time went you know he, he settled in and things got better the family and mom really saved my life when was the first time he called you mom it wasn't very long afterwards, but he, he, his mom is in his life. And I encourage that, like when you come home, you got it, because you know, we don't live in Birmingham anymore. We've moved and he moved with us. She agrees the situation, he's better with us, you know. Um, and she loved him enough to put him in a good, safer spot. And, and that needs to be commended um, because she's, She's his mom, but I'm mom, and I was mom just in a couple of weeks. Um, didn't really say anything about it, it just happened. It just was organic, just mom, and I didn't birth him, but he's mine. And, um, but, you know, he was always coach, and that happened um, until really after his senior year. He, we were in transition. We had taken the central job, and we were moving, and. COVID had happened and there were some things Tez was dealing with at school and trying to get him graduated and things weren't easy for Tez academically for a lot of different reasons and he was making up a lot of work and doing great and he was on a good path and then had a couple of couple of distractions, couple of things that was got him off the rails a little bit that senior year and Patrick came home and, and they had this, you know, confrontation. <laughs> we her. Um, that was, uh, a very strong that. That disagreement. Had, he was trying to get himself eligible to go to Troy. Yeah, I mean, so he had this like opportunity just, at Troy, like and he was close. Anyway, so we we came. It it was a good old confrontation. <laughs> good well, old, uh, yeah. In a very healthy way. In a very healthy uh, way, absolutely. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And Bo happened to be home. Um, I remember on the back porch. Um, we get to just going at it, just arguing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and that's when I really like first um, almost got to see in, into his perspective and what he'd been through. And like, I had always had a dad that had been tough on me and like he had never. And when that begins to hit you, you know, it's like, wow, like, I'm blessed, but I also like want him to stay even more now just to have what, you know, what I have. Um, and I just remember, you know, like, um, you know, he's talking about his, his dad's situation. He's like, I, you know, I never had a dad. And like, we're like crying. Like we're in front of each other's faces, like, like having it out. I'm crying. I'm thinking he's going to run away. He's going to go back. He's, you know, what, 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 stop. And the next morning he wakes up, comes out of his room and said, is dad still home? And I was sitting at my kitchen sink and I turned around and cried because that was the first time, uh, the night that would have been, you know, I'm thinking, oh, he's done with us. He, he's not gonna understand we do this out of love and the discipline of love. And he just walked like it was nothing, like, like yesterday didn't happen. He walked out and he was like, is dad still home? And I can remember turning around and just going, God, you're so incredible. That From that moment on, it was like, it just clicked and it just flipped and he knew he was one of ours and vice versa. And from that moment on, he, he um, you know, he just called our, our house home. I found it pretty interesting that we were talking to your head coach. He said, when you told me you were coming back, you also began the recruiting pitch of a certain wide receiver to come join you. What's your version of that story? Yeah, so like we had quite a few guys leave after the season, um, including a receiver. And so, you know, knew there was a possibility that we had to go out and get some. And, um, you know, I never thought even before until like after the season, like, you know what, I, I know he can play here and I know he can um, contribute to the team in, in, in various ways. And um, Bo went in and showed the recruiting people. He said, hey, I played with this kid in high school. Tell me what you think. He didn't think anything about it. Well, they come back and said, this dude's really good and started talking to Bo. And Bo was like, yeah, they really like Tez, like really like Tez. 
And so, because I, I, my thing was is we need to be real smart. It, Tez doesn't need to just transfer to transfer. He does not need to transfer to Oregon just because he's your brother. And it's a, it's a, you know, although we know he can play there, but they need to believe he can play there. And so, you know, Bo was like, Dad, they really think he can, he can do it. And so then we started connecting the dots a little bit and, and go, it's taking one step at a time and being slow with it. Then Tez decides to hit the transfer portal, but he had no clue that Oregon was even an option. I remember texting him, I was like, Bo, you think Oregon would take me? Him playing around, this is his Christmas present to me, him playing around. He texts back and said, no, nah, probably not. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Oregon's out the window. So let me, let me think about some other schools. Uh, I didn't want him to think that it was just because of us. I wanted him to think that he was enough. That he's good enough. I didn't want him to think that it's just because of who your older brother he is or who your dad he is. No, you're good enough. You know, and he is. I knew that they were going to um, reach out to him and, and, and give him an offer. And I really wanted to be around when that happened. Um, so when, we, when I got home um, for Christmas break, he was at home at the same time. Um, and, you know, they started, it was right after he got in, into the portal himself. And um, he was getting a lot of calls, like he was blowing up. Um, and so um, Coach Adams, our receivers coach, gave him a call. And you know, I thought Tez was just going to lose it. Like he, he'd never been as, as, as excited as that. And um, it was, just, it was a, a really awesome day for, for the family, but it was a great day for him. Because, you know, dreams can come true no matter how big they might be. Bo come home from Birmingham, leaving with Izzy. He had a bag with an Oregon shirt, Oregon gloves, and Oregon um, shorts. And it was like, and he sat on the table, and that's when I get the Eugene call. And he's in the house. He's, he's never making eye contact with me, though. He's never making eye contact with me. He knows, he knows Coach Adams from the call me, looking at my phone and say, Eugene, I'm like, Okay, this is Oregon, and I'm shaking, like I'm, I'm shaking. He's on the phone, he's telling me, he said, hey, this is, this is Junior Adams from Eugene, Oregon, who wanna offer you a scholarship. And I said, coach, I'm committed. Like, I didn't care about any other team who called me, any other, like, big school. Like, anybody else could've called me, I would've turned it down, but I got Junior Adams on the phone from University of Oregon, I'm going. It's my dream school, I'm going. Um, and I hung up the phone, the first word I said, I said, I'm a duck. And everybody went crazy. And Bo was running around the living room, doing this little, and he, come, he comes, throws the shirt in my face, and I'm like, what is this? Oh, I'm going to Oregon, like, I'm, I'm amped up at this point. I want you to read something that you wrote, if you don't mind. <laughs> wow, um, on April 23rd, 2018, I walked into a home, scared and unsure to expect what to expect, but I knew everything was going to be okay. When I walked into the house, everyone was staring at me, and it made me a little nervous, and all, all of a sudden, Mama Krista walks up to me and says, hey. You're welcome to have anything, just make yourself at home. But before you go to sleep, make sure you tell me good night. And right then, I knew it was my second home. A couple of days passed by, I started working my way towards the pantry. P.S. I did not sleep for two days. <laughs> okay, run along to me going into the pantry eating all the Welch's gummy snacks. <laughs> yes, and I, would, I wasn't crazy about them on their teeth, but yeah, I would buy them for him. Um, but yet, I did it, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Now today is her birthday, and I no longer call her Miss Nix. I call her Mom, Mama, Ma. Never call her Krista because she might wring my neck. But happy birthday, I love you, mama. Have the best day ever. I wish, I wish I was there to hug you. Wow, this is, this is a. <laughs> this is a. This is a crazy moment. He's my kid. He's pretty special. That, that, that day was the best moment of my life. When you look back on this, this time, this season, think about that moment on April 23rd, 2018, when you mm -hmm. became part of that family. 
And then think of the eight-year-old lying on the ground as bullets are coming through the door. How can you put into context your story and your path right now? Um, I say I've done pretty well for the future, for the future self of me. Um, Cause I could have easily taken the same route as others out there that are in jail. But um, I want to say that me working hard and being being adopted and just never giving up on the, that one dream I had as a kid and actually having it come to a reality, it's, it's so real. It, it's something that I enjoy. It's something that I will always remember, something I will tell grandkids for a long time. Um, for, 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 for kids out there just like, just going through the same stuff I went through as a kid, just, just always dream big because dreams does come true.